Hello and welcome to module 11 of the Netbox Zero to Hero training course. If you haven't already checked out the earlier modules yet, then you can find the link to them in the notes below to get started. For this demo, I'm using a Docker instance of Netbox running locally on my laptop. If you'd like to follow along with the demo, then you can easily do that. There are a couple of links down below to help you spin up your own instance of Netbox, along with a link to the course that accompanies the video. Now it's time for the Brisbane office to go live and Eric is using a custom script to update the status of the site, plus all the locations, racks, devices, clusters and VMs at the site, from planned to active. This will be much quicker and more convenient than having to go into each section of the Netbox UI to update the status of all the objects. He can simply run the script to update everything in a couple of seconds. Eric's boss has also just informed him that a new branch office is planned for Stockholm in Sweden and that he should start to plan for this. As the company has standardised on the same network equipment for all branch office locations, Eric is going to use another custom script to create the planned site in Netbox and populate it with all the network devices that he's planning to deploy there. Eric is logged into Netbox and has already copied the two scripts into the scripts folder on the Netbox server. To view the available scripts, they are under the other section and under the heading scripts. And here you can see the two scripts that are available to run. The first one that Eric will run is the site status bulk updater script. And if you click on it, you can see the description. This script will update the status of a site and all locations, racks, devices, clusters, and VMs. So before we run the script, let's take a look at the code. I've opened the file called site status bulk updater.py and starting at the top, there are the import statements. All custom scripts must inherit from the extras.scripts.script base class. This class provides the functionality necessary to generate forms and log activity. Next, as the script is working with objects within the DSIM and virtualization data models, we import some classes from here too. Taking virtualization as an example, from virtualization.models, we import the virtual machine and cluster class. And from virtualization.choices, we import virtual machine status choices and cluster status choices. If you're not familiar with Python or you're just starting out with it, then it will help to view the source code of Netbox in the Git repo to see what these import statements are doing. So from the UI, scroll down to the bottom and click on the source code icon to take you there. Okay, so if you navigate to Netbox virtualization models and then virtualmachines.py and scroll down to class virtual machine, you see the base class for a virtual machine that is being imported into the custom script. Next, if you navigate back to virtualization choices.py, you can see, for example, the class of cluster status choices, and you see the status choices available for clusters. So as the custom script is importing these Python classes, we can make use of them to be able to update the status of virtualization objects. I hope that makes sense. And the point here is that the complete Python environment is available to a custom script, including all of Netbox's internal mechanisms. So if you're developing your own custom scripts, then at some point you'll probably need to refer to the Netbox source code. Okay, back to the script itself. After the imports, you have the script class that inherits the script base class. There is also some class metadata, in this case, the name and a description of what the script does. The next section is a set of variables that the script will use. And you can see that these map to the user inputs for the script in the web UI. For example, the first input is the site name. And this means the user will see a drop down menu containing a list of the sites. The next variable is site status. And this makes use of the site status choices class, which means that the user is presented with a drop down of the available status choices for sites with a default value of active. Then moving down, the other variables are very similar in that they display the available status choices for each object type. Okay, that's the script variables. Now the other component that a custom script needs to have is a run method. And this is where your script's execution logic lives. The run method accepts two arguments, data, which is a dictionary containing all the variable data passed in via the web form, and commit, which is a Boolean, i.e. either true or false, indicating whether database changes will be committed or not. So the first part of the code here from line 59 down to line 62 is making the update to the status of the site object, which is pulled from the site objects using the get method with the name being passed in as the value of the site name key from the data dictionary. Then the status is set to be the value of site status and the object is then saved and a log message written on a successful update. 
then the rest of the code is very similar. But because there are likely multiple objects for locations, racks and devices, etc., at the site being updated, the script loops over each object. For example, in lines 66 to 69, for each location matched by filtering the location object by the site name, the script updates the status, saves the object and writes a log message. Okay, so that's a quick run through of the code. Now flip back to the UI and before running it, just check the status of the devices, for example. And you can see that all devices at the Brisbane site have a status of planned. So let's launch the script now and select the Brisbane site and then all the other input variables are defaulted to active. But just to show you, if you click on the drop down next to devices, for example, you can see the device status choices that are available as they were imported at the top of the script. One last thing to note is that if you just want to test your script without committing any changes to the database, then you can simply uncheck the box at the bottom. We'll leave it checked and click run script. The run takes a few seconds to complete and at the end of it, you can see all the log messages that were generated for the objects being updated. And just to double check that, have a quick look around. And the site is now active. The rack is active and all the devices are active. So you can also confirm the changes in the change log. If you click the first record, for example, you can see the difference in the status from planned to active. Fantastic, that's the first script run. And the next one Eric will run is the new branch script. And this is what it looks like in the web interface with inputs for all the data required to add a new site and all of its devices. Before running, let's just take a quick look at the code again. All the variables are defined again, and these display the user inputs for the site name and the number and model of devices to add. So that's fairly straightforward. And then in the run method, the site is created first. Then take a look at how the access switches are created, for example. From line 57 to 68, the role of the switch is defined as access switch, which is one of the device roles that already exists. And then for each switch, it creates a new device with the device type being the switch model, the name being the slug of the site in uppercase, and then dash SW, then dash the number of the switch. The site value is the site that has just been created. The status uses the device status choices method and sets it to planned. And the role is also set based on the value of the switch role variable. And then the new object is saved and a success log message is generated. This same pattern of code repeats for the routers, wireless access points and servers. And then finally, the last step from line 110 generates a CSV table of the new devices, which is then displayed in the output. Okay, so let's give this script a run from the web UI. The new site is in Stockholm, Sweden. So the name will be SWSTO01. It will have four switches that are the Juniper EX4348P model. Then it has two ISR4321 WAN routers, six MR56 access points, and four ProLiant DL380 servers. So click on Run Script, and you can now see the success log messages. And in the output, you have the CSV formatted list of the devices that have been created. So to check the data, go to Sites, and there is the new site with the status of planned. Click on the site, and then the devices and you can see the list of all the newly created devices. How easy was that? So I hope that's been a useful overview of what custom scripts are in Netbox and what kind of tasks they can be used to accomplish. You also learned the basics of writing custom scripts and where to find documentation to help you develop your own scripts. You also got a head start with the two example scripts included with this module. If you fancy a challenge, why not see if you can develop one of the scripts further? For example, you could also create the rack for the new site and then assign all newly created devices to the next available rack unit positions. Or you could also add in patch panels, console servers and PDUs to make adding a new site even easier. If you want to share your own custom scripts or you have any questions as you go through the course, then pop on over to the Netbox Zero to Hero channel on the NetDev community Slack. If you aren't already a member, then you can sign up for free using the link below. So once again, thanks very much for watching.